I don't believe the Alabama Supreme Court, insofar as the significance and importance and impact of what the drug companies did to the state Medicaid program, don't think there's any more important case that will come before that court. On two separate occasions before the opinion came down, we asked for oral argument, which is normally granted in even insignificant cases, but certainly in important cases. I, I've talked to a, a retired member of the court and asked him this question. I said, how many times in your career has a case of this importance not been granted oral argument? He said, never, ever. Now, the reason oral argument's important is if you took this opinion and read the opinion and had not attended the trial and had not read the record, you would have no idea that the two even mesh together. They are totally inconsistent. For the Alabama Supreme Court to refuse oral argument is a, is a tragedy and a travesty, but secondly, they will have to change the rules that they have operated under in this state for years and years. For example, credibility of witnesses. They have substituted their judgment for the credibility of witnesses, which is a total change in the law. They also have changed the burden of proof in this case. The state of Alabama, on all the motions that they ruled on, the law says that they have to consider the evidence most favorable to the state. They did not do that in one single instance in this opinion. Now, I'm going to go through some things that I think are important that, that everybody needs to know about. I prepared, you will have this in the handout, but also I just labeled this the truth about the Medicaid fraud litigation. I just want to point out also our law firm represents eight other states that have filed similar litigation, lawsuits against the companies for the very same conduct. And in no state have we run into the resistance that we've run into from the Alabama Supreme Court with any court in any state. But I mentioned that in the beginning about the consolidation on appeal, which is highly, highly unusual, let's say. And secondly, we found at least 50 separate instances where at least six of the judges who were in the main opinion either ignored or misstated the actual record, and that's the evidence from the trial of the AstraZeneca case, or failed to establish, to follow established Alabama law. In fact, when you consider that, it's many more times than 50. Now, this right here is very significant. Those of you who, who attended the trials, they say the state of Alabama should have known about the fraud. The federal government, for the first time, the Justice Department and the Attorney General's Office, the Department of Justice, did a massive investigation of the drug industry, the manufacturers. They found massive fraud committed by the companies, the same type fraud that we sued them on in Alabama. And they issued a report. And I've, I've put this in your packet. The Office of Inspector General, after they got the, the findings of the investigations, they issued an official document in the year 2003 and for the first time put the companies on notice that the fraudulent conduct had to stop. And that, that is in writing, it's in black and white. In fact, they sent the guidelines out to the drug manufacturers to present, to actually stop and prevent and reduce the fraud and abuse in the health care program, specifically Medicaid, and they, they, they laid out exactly what the, the companies were to do in the future. Now, interestingly enough, in this case, in, in, in one of the cases on appeal, AstraZeneca, this company pled guilty to the a criminal charge of fraud under the very same facts that we tried the case on in the civil courts in Montgomery County. So you have a company pleading guilty to fraud for defrauding the Medicaid agency. They paid a fine of $570 million to the federal government. In that same case, they also settled with a number of states and paid them hundreds of millions of dollars, as I recall, 360 somewhere in that neighborhood. And the same type fraud in Alabama, the Supreme Court says it's fraud, but the state should have known about it. Now, 
I have great difficulty in understanding how the state could know and the federal government up until the year 2003 didn't know that the companies were committing fraud. And let me point this out very forcefully. The state of Alabama, nor any other state, has the right to look at the records of the drug companies under the law. They have to depend on what the companies give to the state insofar as the prices. They were submitting false prices. The only person who knew those prices were false were the drug companies involved. And you might just consider this. We settled with several other companies under the same facts, the same law, for $138 million, and they had good lawyers who knew Alabama law. So why would those companies settle for hundreds of millions and these companies go to the Alabama Supreme Court? It, 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 a question that only the court can answer. Now, if you recall, those of you who attended the trial, we had the pricing, the, the pricing manager for AstraZeneca, and we put him on the stand. He is the person who said, Mr. Schultz, Eric Schultz, he said, I can no longer condone what this company is doing. He basically admitted to the fraud. He left the company because he could not condone what this company was doing to all of the states, not just Alabama. Now, this is in the record. You won't find that in the, in the Supreme Court's opinion. In fact, interestingly enough, and maybe ironically, nothing uh, insofar as the bad conduct of this company or any of the th three companies on appeal were even mentioned by the Alabama Supreme Court. So interestingly also and significant in my opinion, AstraZeneca is, is a part of the settlements that I've mentioned with the federal government and, and, the, and the states under that one drug. They also agreed in the future to submit true prices to the state Medicaid agencies. Now this was in the year long, this, is, this was very significant because it, it shows that Alabama didn't know nor did any other state know about the fraud. Now, We had 13 state attorney generals actually submitting briefs on the state's behalf in support of the state of Alabama, as did AARP. And we met on numerous occasions by telephone conference with legal counsel for AARP, and they totally agreed with us that fraud had been committed and the state of Alabama was entitled to file the lawsuit and be successful. Now, Troy King, the attorney general of Alabama, has been under a great deal of, of criticism by a lots of folks, primarily folks who represent the drug companies. I want to point out that not only did Troy King support this litigation, but so did the governor of the state of Alabama, Bob Riley. In fact, uh, Governor Riley gave us complete and total support, as did his legal counsel, and uh, that has not changed and will continue. So in asking for rehearing, we have the support of the governor of Alabama, we have the support of the attorney general of the state of Alabama, we have the support of 13 states attorneys general plus AERP, which just maybe not incidentally but significantly has over 500,000 members in the state of Alabama who are affected by what the Supreme Court has done in this lawsuit. Now, I could go on and, and, and I will say this. The Supreme Court also mentioned a statute that was passed. It dealt with many care, not Medicaid, and it had a definition in there that Congress passed a law at the request and the insistence of the lobbyists for the drug industry, which changed the definition of significant things such as WAC and AWP. Now, the Supreme Court said that's important. The reason it is absolutely, totally not important in this case is that that law did not take effect until the Alabama lawsuit had been filed. So they, either the Supreme Court didn't know that or they believed an amicus brief that was filed by a trade association representing folks against us who indicated to the court that that was a controlling statute which was totally false, but the Supreme Court fell for it. And I'm hoping when they go back and read the record, I don't, I, you know, I'm not being, well, let me say this. 
I don't believe all those justices read that record because any, any first year law student who had read that record would know that some of the stuff in that opinion, 50 times plus, did not exist in the record or was misstated in the opinion. So I believe when they read the record, and that's why it's so important to have oral argument in this case, because what I'm saying to you today should be said to the court where all of the media is present and the people of Alabama would have access and would gain knowledge as to really what happened to this trial. Because when I go through a trial for weeks and then I read the record and then I read the Supreme Court opinion, it's like daylight and dark. Absolutely no correlation on the key points that were mentioned by the court. Let me mention one thing and I'll open for questions. The court relied on the Hunt opinion, which was an oil and gas case. They also relied on the Exxon case. There's a basic difference in assuming, which I disagree with, but assuming that those two cases would have any application to this case, here's why they cannot be applied in this case. And this, from a legal standpoint, is again, a third year law student would understand this. The state of Alabama had no access in this case to the records of AstraZeneca or any other drug company. Under the law, we cannot get those records. We have no access to those records. In both Hunt and Exxon, at least in those cases, the records, the royalty records, were filed with the state of Alabama and the court in those two cases said the state did have access and should have understood them and should have acted on them. In this case, the state could not possibly have done anything because they did not have access to those records. And again, I don't believe the Alabama Supreme Court really fully understood, or maybe to this day understands, this particular point. And hopefully, we've, we have stated this in our application for rehearing, and I believe that knowing these justices individually and collectively, I believe that they are men and women of good character and intelligence and an understanding of the law, and I believe they're going to have to grant rehearing without any doubt in this case. Now, as far as the future of this litigation, we intend after rehearing, if the cases are sent back for trial, we'll try them again. If, if they are reversed in, in our direction on rehearing, then we'll be certainly very well pleased with that because the Medicaid program is absolutely broke and needs the money. But as far as the other cases, we intend to go forward with those cases and try them as the judge sets them. We had wanton counts in, in, in the cases which we can pursue, even worst case scenario, we still go forward on the wanton count. And the wanton claim is simply this. If, if these companies intentionally did what they did with knowledge that it would hurt the state of Alabama, that under Alabama law, unless that's changed, is wantonness. So if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to try to answer them. Uh, I would hope that uh, we first get oral argument granted and then I would hope that uh, within maybe 60 days. Uh, uh, one case came out of the Supreme Court that came out of Macon County recently that I thought was kind of interesting. A $1.8 million verdict in a slip and fall case, which normally you don't win even at the trial level. Court saw fit to affirm that case without writing opinion, just simply stamped affirmed on it. So I'm hoping that the uh, verdict in these cases would be slightly, first of all, would be well founded on the law, and secondly, would be cases that would affect every citizen in the state of Alabama. Because the losers in this instance up to this point have been the taxpayers who, who foot the bill for the Medicaid program, and the, the tragedy is that the folks affected by the Medicaid program are the people who have been really uh, kicked in the stomach by this opinion, or maybe kicked even worse. When does the next case come out? Well, we have cases set in December and January. Uh, the court is very likely going to call all of us together, the lawyers in those cases, and uh, make a decision as to whether to wait for the Supreme Court to rehear this case and, and change its opinion. 
so I really don't know exactly that exactly I'm, I'm hoping that we can get the Supreme Court to act before any of those cases are tried because it's much better to, to know you know if the court's going to have a, a, a wake-up call and read the law and read the record Uh, Watson, D was it Watson and, and uh, uh, who? Uh, Milan, yeah. Were they going to be tried together? They were to be tried together in Montgomery. In Montgomery. And uh, we are actively in, involved in the other states now with all of these same companies. And uh, we, we feel like that uh, th this case, in fact, one judge. A judge in Kentucky made this statement about the Alabama Supreme Court. They said this the Alabama Supreme Court substituted its judgment for the judgment of the jury on the evidence and would pay no attention. They tried to use this opinion in Kentucky and he, the judge said this absolutely, totally can't do it. I, I really don't. I, I would like to know, uh, first of all, the, the fraud. Fraud is fraud. And, you know, when, when a court has to say that the victim of fraud uh, has a burden to, to do something that they physically and, and uh, really can't do in any, because we don't have access to the records. And they totally misunderstood the formula. I mean, they, they botched that as badly as anything else in the opinion. They, this, our formula in Alabama had nothing to do with the fraud, and the federal government, uh, CMS, had actually approved Alabama's uh, formula after the early uh, confrontations over that formula. So, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling that they would even write that uh, having a formula where you would have, say, WAC plus nine point some odd and AWP minus ten, whatever it was, point two. That was done, had nothing to do with fraud. In fact, the fraud, uh, we had cases where, had instances rather, where the spread that is also illegal under the guidelines and under the federal law, on occasion we'd have a drug that would maybe cost $5 and they were charging the state $1,000. And most, most Alabamians would be shocked to learn that. But without the media letting folks know, if you read this opinion and didn't know anything about the trial, you would think, my goodness, maybe old Skip Tucker's right. If, if you lose the request, you go ahead and get a trial? Yes. Still go ahead. Yes. And we would also look at some, you know, the Constitution guarantees a jury trial. And when a court substitutes its, a, its judgment on credibility of witnesses, and they did that. They did that on every single witness that they quoted in the opinion. They substituted their judgment for the judgment of 12 intelligent jurors and also a highly intelligent trial judge who, who saw firsthand and, and had an opportunity to uh, judge credibility. And everybody ought to go back and read Judge Price's order on the post-verdict uh, post motions by these three defendants. He Judge Price saw the trials, heard the evidence, and ruled that they were guilty of massive frauds. As, as well, for example, just days before this opinion came down, a federal appeals court had an appeal on the very same facts with the very same company, AstraZeneca, and a jury verdict against AstraZeneca up on appeal, they said AstraZeneca was guilty of fraud. The Supreme Court of Alabama had that information, we again asked for oral argument after that judgment came down. Then, days before the trial, uh, before the opinion came out, in Kentucky, under the same facts that we had helped develop for the lawyers in Kentucky, a jury there and a judge found again AstraZeneca guilty of fraud and returned a multi-million dollar verdict against them. So, uh, we, we are, we're going to we are not discouraged, we are disappointed in the Supreme Court. We are shocked at, at what the Supreme Court did, but we are not going to stop, we're going forward, and as long as I have breath in me, I'm going to keep fighting this fight. And I realize that under the bar rules that I have to be extremely cautious about criticizing the court insofar as competence, uh, whatever, and I hope I have not done that. 
if I have, I'm going to give them a chance to correct what they've done on, on, on this case by simply rehearing the case and letting us come into, into the openness of, of the Supreme Court chamber with news media folks there and argue this case to them, which we've not had the chance to do so far. Yes. Yeah. The approach would simply be, if, if, well, if, uh, if this ain't fraud, I've never seen fraud, but if the Supreme Court of Alabama in its whatever decides that it's not fraud or if it's fraud and Alabama should have known, then we will simply try it on the Walton count and change the strategy in, 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 as far as our trial technique, but it won't change the evidence because, for example, this, this Mr. Schultz, and you ought to go back and read the record on what he said about his own company. He left the company because he couldn't stomach what they were doing. And he was also afraid because of this investigation that he'd go to jail. But can you imagine a company paying $570 million as a criminal fine for the same type of activity that the Alabama Supreme Court says is not fraud in Alabama with a lesser burden of proof? Well, under their standard of review, they have to say the state the state's evidence has to be looked at most favorably, not what some amicus brief comes from some trade association. In fact, most of this opinion came straight out of an amicus brief, which shocks me. It was one, supposedly a pharmaceutical, I'm not, I'm not sure which one, there were two that filed. In fact, uh, most all of them that filed were connected with the drug industry in some fashion. and. Uh, you know, the drug industry is powerful. Man, they are some kind of powerful. They are powerful in Washington. They are powerful in Alabama. They are politically active at every level. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to know that politics had anything to do with this thing, and I'm not implying that at all. In fact, if I were, I'd be more interested in AARP supporting me than some jack-leg trade association that is taking money from the, pharma, from the drug companies. Oh, the wantonness count. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, the only strategy would be that we, we, we wouldn't be talking about fraud. We'd be talking about intentional conduct. In fact, wantonness can be reckless even. But here we, we talk wanton, uh, which under, under the Alabama law, unless they change this, it's simply that if you do an intentional act or if you do it recklessly with the understanding that your actions or lack of actions will result in damage to a third to the victim, then that's wantonness. Okay. And uh, here, there's no question. I mean, we we've got their own folks. In fact, uh, during the during the uh, all the trials, we we put their own folks on the stand. They quit bringing them because they actually quit bringing corporate representatives to the trials because we were putting their folks on the on the stand. We were proving our case through their own witnesses. And Mr. Schultz, if anybody who saw him, he was absolutely scared, slapped to death that he was going to jail. In other words, fraud would be intentionally deceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Money. Yeah. Just recklessly doing it. Not really. Well, it can be intentional. It doesn't have to be intentional, but we're going to prove intent okay. to do it. Because. Um, but that mean you're not doing it for money then? No, there would be damages involved, yeah. But in other words, I'm just trying to distinguish between fraud and there's really no difference other than the fact that uh, one's called wantonness and one's called fraud. Uh, he, we had two elements of fraud here, two, two, two principles. One was misrepresentations. Secondly was suppression, where you were concealing the truth, which is really the strongest part of the case, probably. And uh, we tried the AstraZeneca case, and, and the jury found them guilty both of misrepresentations and also concealment and suppression. So. Uh, the wanton aspect of it would be, and we didn't think we needed wantonness because we thought fraud was so strong. But here, they intentionally intended to cheat the states by giving false prices. And so that would be wanton conduct. And the, the defendants know that. The, the Alabama Supreme Court said you, you sh should have known about fraud. Yeah. There's no way you could have known about wantonness. Uh, no, in fact, that's not even a factor in wantonness. Okay. So that's why you were supposed to. It, and, 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 and really, uh, 
on the on the knowledge aspect of it, it's called reasonable reliance, and uh, there's no way in the world that the state of Alabama could have known that they were cheating because they had act, they being the defendants, the drug companies had total control over their records. We 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 could not have looked at their records. We couldn't even request them under the law, and that was done in Washington, where the the drug companies are so powerful. For example, who would ever imagine that a drug company, a drug companies who have gotten a law passed in Congress that says that the federal government can't even negotiate prices on, on federal programs with the drug companies, just take what to give them. But, but here, the, 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 we're talking about fraud. Do, do they all know law or case law say that you have no fraud with the drug companies? Uh, the, 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 case, the case law doesn't say you have to know about it. They say that it's, it's a reasonable reliance. Uh, issue that you have to have to deal with, but under the under the uh, rules up to this point, at least, the state they'd have to look at what we presented more favorably, and, and they did not. In fact, not only did they, they changed the law there, the rules they didn't even consider what the state of Alabama said on, on the on the knowledge aspect of it, and. But I go back to this, and I, I guess I'm just a simple fellow when I try to think of something, but. If the federal government didn't know it until 2003, then how in the world could the state of Alabama have known? So you said it was impossible to even do a government It was absolutely impossible. And, and everybody who testified said they did not know it. I can't imagine a Supreme Court or anybody else saying that a, 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 a commissioner of the Medicaid program would intentionally allow over a period of years, the defendants to commit fraud and cheat the state. I mean, that's mind-boggling. That would be a reflection on governors, commissioners, everybody. What, what evidence did the Supreme Court decide to say that you had? They went back to this, uh, to a uh, memo that was written by Mary Finch, who, by the way, did not even testify in the AstraZeneca case and could not possibly have been a part of that record. They took a memo that had, that had nothing to do with knowledge of fraud, and they talked about the formula, about adjusting the formula. I mean, all the states adjust the formula, and Alabama's formula was adjusted, and the, the feds approved it. And so there was no reason to go any further. But the fact that you have a formula doesn't mean, for example, the WAC price, which is the base price, when they're committing fraud there, then everything above that is compounding and and the court didn't understand that they obviously didn't understand the concept of the WAC reporting and the AWP reporting they, they couldn't have or they wouldn't have written this opinion yes in fact in you'll find in the uh, package in fact I'm gonna bore you with this but this came out of our brief on rehearing we just simply asked the court these questions is the court now changing its rules to allow matters outside the record to be considered as material evidence affecting the court's decision, which they did in this case? Un unknowings, I hope. Certainly not intentionally, I hope. Secondly, is the court now changing the standard of review on motions for judgment as a matter of law, which is what they ruled on, to permit it to disregard substantial evidence when reviewing the issue of reasonable reliance? And they, they would have to change the law, in this case, to reach the decision they reached. Thirdly, is this court now changing its rules to allow it, the court, not the jury, to be the sole judge of the credibility of witnesses? Up to this point, I'm older than some of you here. In my entire career, I have never, ever seen a Supreme Court opinion which substituted its collective view on credibility of witnesses as opposed to the jury and the trial judge. They did it in this case. And then fourth question we asked the court, is this court now permitting egregious fraud, which I believe it means real bad, deemed criminal in another forum, which was in the federal courts, to go unremitted and unpunished because the victim chose a certain reimbursement method which was accepted by the defendant under which the victim relied under the honesty on the honesty of the defendant. In other words, we had to accept 
the numbers they gave us insofar as the prices. You see, there are 60,000 drugs. Those claims come in daily. Alabama had three people handling those claims, three, in the Medicaid program. Uh, how many do you? About 60 pending cases now in Alabama. 62. <coughs> oh, in the other states, uh, hundreds. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, we've been, we've been. I can't say too much about what we've been doing, but the defendants know they're committed fraud. I mean, <laughs> we've been talking to them in states all over the country, settling cases and. Mm, we the, well, we had one set in Hawaii last week, but it, I can't comment on it. But it won't be tried. You were just reading now from the rehearing. Th this is actually in our brief. I, I think we put that in the uh, package. If we didn't, I can show it to you. This was just a brief we we submitted with our application for rehearing. Under the rules, you have to do a formal application for rehearing, and then you have the right to file a brief in support of it. And we just asked some simple questions to the court because I don't think they want to be embarrassed over this, and you know they know their own rules. And if they're going to change them, they ought to just say, "We're going to change them for this for this particular case, for whatever reason," which they're going to have to do to deny rehearing to the state of Alabama. They got to change the law. In terms of when you take things out of the record, I, I just can't believe they really knew they did that. I think they just trusted that amicus brief writer to tell them the truth. I hope. Yeah. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, on Scout's honor, Mary Finch did not testify in the AstraZeneca trial. And I, I, wasn't, I didn't go far in the Scouts, but I understood the difference in truthful and not truthful. And I did learn to read, and reading the record, I can't find where Mayor Finch testified, because she didn't. Amicus said she did. It was one of the trade associations, and I, rather than say, I'd, I'd have to go, I can tell you, but it, it was one of, the, one of the amicus, and there were so many filed. One for the, one of the pharmaceutical groups, but I can't remember which one. I hope they didn't cut and paste, but so it looked like it. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, well, they probably, I can't say just direct quotes out of it, but that's where the stuff came from. For example, it, it was admitted at trial that the Medicare statute that was passed didn't take effect until after we tried the lawsuit, I mean, after we, we filed the lawsuit. That was admitted by their folks. In fact, the thing that really blows my mind is that we put their corporate representatives on, people who knew about what they were doing, and we ask them, do you have to tell the truth? Yes. Did, and you know if you didn't tell the truth and you intentionally committed fraud that you're going to have to pay damages to the state? They all said yes, yes, yes. And then the Supreme Court ignores it. Totally ignores it. So in other words, last minute, I have a brief. Is the court only to Uh, they, can, they, can, they have to take it. They can't change the record. I mean, an amicus brief has to, they, they can, well, they could just file a brief and say the state's wrong. And they could just say that without any justification, without any other, just a one page, one sentence thing. They could just file this thing and say state's wrong, drug company's right. But, that, you know, they went further than that. But they obviously had not read the record. But did Mary Fee testify other cases? Yes. Uh, they really didn't take the, her testimony. They really didn't. In fact, they gave no explanation in the opinion as to what, what that, they took it totally out of context, misstated it, and, and, and in the other cases, she did explain it as to what that memo really meant. Oh, yeah. And they, in the AstraZeneca case, I mean, she, she's a, one of the controlling factors, as, as was the statute that I mentioned. And they had, to, they had, I say they had to, they did that because there wasn't any way else they could go. I mean, they had to have something and they took that. But they really didn't realize, apparently, that it could not possibly have applied retroactively. It, it, it did not. So, if you test on another case, you can't use that testimony no. to argue this 
unless you unless it's in the record of this case so cannot do it yes we, we pointed that in our in fact you'll have the uh, uh, you, I believe you have from the package uh, the actual application we filed and we listed each instance where they had either taken things out of context or not in the record where they brought in stuff from outside or misstated the law. And we counted them up in the three cases and we quit counting when we got to 50. So. What, is the, what options do you have if they deny right here? Uh, go forward with the warrant counts, but in these cases we cannot do that. Well, I, there is a federal issue, and I was going to kind of allude to that a while ago, and since I'm not a constitutional lawyer and probably uh, would have to rely on those who have been telling us that uh, the Constitution guarantees a jury trial, and when you substitute your view for that of the jury, when you legally cannot do that, we might have an issue in federal court. It could be a due process uh, and denying oral argument in a case of this magnitude. I, I don't know that a case has ever said that's the denial of due process. I suspect it is, but I, I would defer to the constitutional experts. So, if there are no further questions, after you look at in, the information, if you've got any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, we believe that if the court follows the law and does not change its own rules insofar as the review rules, that rehearing will be granted in each of these three cases. I'm as confident of that as I can possibly be, knowing what I know about the record and the law. And we've had some very astute lawyers who do nothing but appellate work and look at the record and look at the opinion and to say they were shocked after they got off the floor, they were shocked because they, they could not believe what had happened. When was the request uh, Monday, this past Monday. Oh, no, no, last Friday. We, we filed it on the last day. And we, in fact, uh, we had midnight on Friday was the deadline and we, we, met, the, we met those requirements. So, but after, after you look at the uh, information. I was going to show you some stuff from the trial. For example, where one of the witnesses said, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about one of that corporate folks said, what we've done is a sham. I mean, he's, that's under oath. And another one said, we use this smoke and mirrors approach where we show one thing when it's really another. I mean, I mean I, I've never seen stronger trial testimony than what we've had in these cases. And, uh, in fact, I, I, just, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I believe in the system enough to believe that this court is going to do the right thing. If I didn't, I, I, I'd be greatly concerned about the future of the judiciary in this state.